Hello, in this video I'm going to talk about the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are two of the huge main players in regulating endocrine function in the human body. So in order to truly understand the endocrine system, we need to explore these two organs in a bit more detail. The pituitary gland is often referred to as the master gland of the body, and that's because the pituitary gland itself releases several hormones that regulate many other glands. The hypothalamus controls the pituitary, so I guess the hypothalamus is the master master gland of the body. <laughs> so both of these structures are located in the brain, and if you've studied the brain, then you have studied these a little bit. So we're going to take a look at these in a bit more detail now. So there's a certain hierarchy of hormonal control in the human body. The hypothalamus controls the pituitary, and then the pituitary gland controls many of the other glands in the body. So we'll take a look at this hierarchy of control. So in this picture here, we can see the structural relationship between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So the hypothalamus is located superior to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus through a structure called the infundibulum. And then the pituitary gland itself is sitting in the cella turcica of the sphenoid bone. You might have noticed in that picture that the front part and the back part of the pituitary gland look different, and that's because they are different. So the pituitary gland is also known as the hypophysis, and the front part of the pituitary is known as the adenohypophysis. It's also called the anterior pituitary. The back part of the pituitary is also known as the neurohypophysis, also referred to as the posterior pituitary. These two structures are very unique. It's almost like we have two completely separate organs that just got smashed together into one organ. They have completely different functions. They are different in their structure. They even come from different embryonic origins. When the anterior pituitary, or the uh, adenohypophysis, if you will, is formed, what happens is part of the roof of your mouth actually travels up to become the adenohypophysis. And order, in order to form the neurohypophysis, part of your brain tissue actually moves down to become the neurohypophysis. So they are very unique structures. Um, the neurohypophysis is called neuro because of that nervous tissue embryonic origin and because it does contain nervous tissue and of course hypophysis just means pituitary. The adenohypophysis is called adeno because adeno means gland and this is going to be a structure that produces a lot of hormones. So let's first take a closer look at the neurohypophysis. So in the picture here we're going to concentrate on this back part, um, the neurohypophysis. So if we just look at the neurohypophysis, we see these green and blue strings there. But if we follow the green and blue strings up, we can see that they're attached to things in the hypothalamus. And this is a very unique situation. What's going on here is that we have neurons that have cell bodies located in the hypothalamus and their axons are extending down the infundibulum, and then the axons of these neurons terminate in the neurohypophysis. So this is a very, very, very unique and very different from what we're gonna see with the adenohypophysis. So here's another picture showing you the same kind of idea. Um, you have neuron cell bodies that are located in the hypothalamus, and those axons of those neurons extend down the infundibulum and then the axons terminate in the neurohypophysis itself. The neurohypophysis is going to release two hormones. These two hormones are antidiuretic hormone, better known as ADH, and then the other hormone is oxytocin. ADH is a hormone that's very important for regulating blood pressure and blood volume, whereas oxytocin is a hormone that's involved with the um, process of labor and in the human sexual response. Now these two hormones are released by the ends of axons at the neurohypophysis, but these two hormones are actually made by the neuron cell bodies up in the hypothalamus. 
So technically, while these two hormones are made in the hypothalamus, they are released at the neural hypophysis. Like all endocrine hormones, ADH and oxytocin are released into the bloodstream. Okay. So in this example, we have neurons releasing a chemical into the bloodstream. Now, normally when neurons release a chemical, we call it a neurotransmitter. But we don't call it a neurotransmitter if the chemical is being released in the bloodstream. We call it a hormone. The relationship between the hypothalamus and the adenohypophysis is a little bit different. But let's take a closer look at this adenohypophysis then. So the adenohypophysis is more glandular than it is nervous tissue. The Adenohypophysis contains many unique cell types that produce and release seven different hormones. And like all endocrine hormones, these hormones are going to be released into the blood. The hormones that are made and released by the adenohypophysis include growth hormone, which is of course important for the process of growth, prolactin, which is a hormone that's important for lactation, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is a hormone that will travel to the thyroid gland and cause the thyroid gland to release hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, also known as ACTH. Um, I know it's got a big long name, but the name tells you that it's going to target the adrenal glands. Um, and one of the things that it does is it causes the release of cortisol from the adrenal glands. The last two hormones are um, FSH and LH, and these are both considered gonadotropins because they affect the gonads. FSH is also known as follicle stimulating hormone, and LH is also known as luteinizing hormone. And these names are based on the effects that these hormones have in the female, um, but they do also play a role in the male. So FSH and LH are both hormones that are important for both male and female reproductive systems. So now that we know a little bit about the nature of the adenohypophysis and the neurohypophysis. We can look at how the hypothalamus controls these two structures, because as you can imagine, the adenohypophysis and the neurohypophysis will be controlled in very different ways since they are such very different structures. You probably could have already guessed how the hypothalamus is going to control the neurohypophysis. Right? Now, don't forget, with the neurohypophysis, what we have here are ends of axons, and the cell bodies of these neurons are located in the hypothalamus. So, how can we stop or start the release of ADH and oxytocin in the neurohypophysis? That's the question. How are we going to regulate the release of ADH and oxytocin in the neurohypophysis? That's pretty easy. These neuron cell bodies in the hypothalamus either don't or do make ADH and oxytocin. Right? So if these neurons are making ADH, then the ADH will then be released in the neurohypophysis. But if these neurons are not making the hormone, then the hormone will not be released in the neurohypophysis. So it makes it pretty simple. Now we'll take a look at how the hypothalamus controls the adenohypophysis, and this is going to be quite different. Okay? And that's because we don't have axons of neurons extending down into the adenohypophysis. We are still going to use neurons, though, um, here to help control the adenohypophysis. If you look in the picture here, what we see up in the hypothalamus are neurons. We call these neurosecretory cells. These neurons in the hypothalamus are going to make hormones and they release hormones into the bloodstream. And then these hormones travel through the bloodstream to the adenohypophysis, where these hormones then exert their effect. So what we're gonna have is hormones from the hypothalamus controlling the release of hormones from the adenohypophysis. So this is an example of hormones controlling the release of hormones. Okay. The Neurosecretory cells of the hypothalamus are going to release these hormones into a special blood vessel called the hypophysal portal system. And it's a big fancy name, but basically it's just talking about a direct connection, a direct blood vessel connection between the hypothalamus and the adenohypophysis. So let's take a look at some examples here. 
the neurons in the hypothalamus, for example, might release a hormone called growth hormone releasing hormone. So the growth hormone releasing hormone would be released into the hypophysal portal system. It would travel to the adenohypophysis where it would exert its effect. And the effect would be, as you can imagine, the release of growth hormone. Another example would be um, there's a hormone called TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone. And this hormone is made up in the hypothalamus by these neurosecretory cells. The TRH is released by the neurosecretory cells into the hypophysal portal system. The TRH travels through that small blood vessel to the adenohypophysis, and there TRH is going to cause the release of TSH. So those are two examples of how we're using hormones from the hypothalamus to control the release of hormones from the adenohypophysis. Hormones of the hypothalamus are going to be controlling the release of hormones from the adenohypophysis. The hypothalamus produces both releasing and inhibiting hormones that target the adenohypophysis. Okay. We've already mentioned a couple of hormones, growth hormone releasing hormone and thyrotropin releasing hormone. So those were both examples of releasing hormones because they cause the release of hormones at the adenohypophysis. An example of an inhibiting hormone is growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So the hypothalamus will produce growth hormone inhibiting hormone. It will travel through the hypophysal portal system to the adenohypophysis where, as you can imagine, it inhibits the release of growth hormone. What's really nice about these hormones coming out of the hypothalamus is that they pretty much are named for exactly what they're doing, right? Growth hormone releasing hormone, growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So their name tells you what they're doing for the most part. If you ever come across a hormone and it has the word releasing or the word inhibiting in its name, most likely it's coming out of the hypothalamus. Okay. So the hypothalamus controls the release of hormones from the adenohypophysis through the use of these releasing and inhibiting hormones. In this picture here, um, we can kind of see uh, a, a broader picture of what's happening with these hormones. Right? So we start up in the hypothalamus. We can see that the hypothalamus can make, um, in this example, four different hormones, but there's more that could be involved. We have TRH, um, which um, is a hormone that will travel from the hypothalamus to the adenohypophysis. And you can see that there it causes the release of another hormone, TSH, TSH will then travel to the thyroid gland where it will cause the release of thyroid hormone. Um, another example could be um, corticotropin releasing hormone. So that's the one in blue. So the hypothalamus releases CRH, the corticotropin releasing hormone, and it goes to the adenohypophysis where it causes the release of ACTH, um, that's adrenocorticotropic hormone. The ACTH then travels through the bloodstream to the adrenal glands where it will do things like cause the release of the hormone cortisol. Right? So um, when it comes to that adenohypophysis, right, you have the hypothalamus releasing hormones that will affect the release of hormones at the adenohypophysis. And then the hormones of the adenohypophysis could possibly cause the release of hormones elsewhere. Of course, some of the hormones coming out of the adenohypophysis aren't affecting hormones at all. Like for example, the adenohypophysis releases prolactin hormone. Prolactin hormone goes to the breast tissue where it causes um, milk production and it, prolactin does not affect the release of other hormones, um, at least not directly.